So we're going to go look at the, the way complex living systems function by entering into one. So we're going to go into the forest here on Bowen Island and have a look at living and dying, working together, and see what we can learn from that. So one of the ways of understanding human systems that's really important to me is to understand them as living systems. Human beings are living beings, and uh, as a result, the systems we're involved in are living systems and are complex. And if you take a look around in here, inside the, uh, the forest, most of us think about a forest, we just think, oh, there's trees standing. And so you can see that there's lots of trees, there's lots of shrubbery, there's lots of understory, there's lots going on here. And in fact, every single thing in this forest is dependent on everything else in order for it to have the character that it has. So if you look down on the forest floor, you'll notice that things are in the process of living and dying at the same time. This new growth here is going to come from all of this decaying growth and all the things that are living in here, the small creatures, the bacteria, the insects that are helping to break this down and create the soil that makes possible this new life. This is a really important dynamic in systems because we imagine that in systems we can go from, if we imagine in systems that we can go straight on from cause to effect, then it gives us an illusion that we can manage the complexity that we're in in the world. But the reality is, is that what makes possible this plant growing is the conditions that are set by all of the living and dying that's going around it. In other words, working effectively in living systems is about setting the conditions for us to, for complexity to take over. Rather than saying, oh, I'm going to grow this particular plant right here, planting a seed and cultivating the conditions. That's not how you get a forest. So it's a fundamentally different approach. Um, to, I think it's a fundamentally, fundamentally important approach and a fundamentally important thing to remember about um, the nature of living systems, that they're complex, that they're constantly evolving, and that they're dependent on initial conditions rather than on um, a straightforward relationship between cause and effect. In a forest, multiple causes give rise to multiple effects, and the effects are emergent. So we can't ever imagine exactly how this forest is going to look um, or what happens when we plant a rhododendron next to a, a Douglas fir tree, whether or not that will um, result in the kind of look that we're looking for. The, the effect, a forest as an overall effect, is a complex and emergent system that's depending on living and dying happening in it at every moment. So the essence is that we, we delude ourselves into believing um, with most systems that we can be responsible for the cause and the effect, that it's a machine. The reality is, is that living systems are complex and it's impossible to, quote, manage this kind of a system. So we need a new approach in leadership to be able to make sense of exactly what's going on in the living system, to make sense of the complex relationships between all of the causes and in order for us to uh, practice and lead better in the moment. So it's impossible to manage a forest, but it is entirely possible to be in one. So I want to kind of put this on a more grounded basis and talk a little bit about um, how human systems then evolve, thinking about this living and dying systems model. The, when Bowen Island was, uh, before Europeans arrived here, um, Bowen Island was used and is still used extensively by First Nations people for all kinds of purposes, mostly harvesting the food. Um, when Europeans arrived here, it looked somewhat like this, uh, Douglas fir forest, uh, probably a little bit thicker, and of course the trees were massive. Um, this is all second growth forest. But this is what people saw when they, when they came to Bowen Island for the first time from, uh, from Europe. And it represented, that represented a real break. When people, people, settlers began arriving here in the 1870s. It was a completely different experience for them than the experience that they had left. So if we think about this in terms of the two arcs, you're talking about a society that was in its ascendance, in the 1870s that had uh, everything going for it and yet people left anyway and came over to this island that was covered in Douglas fir trees to see if they could make a new life. So that pioneer beginning to um, uh, carve out something for themselves, beginning to carve out a community, we had no idea what this community would look like back in the 1870s when people arro arrived here, but they did know that they had to begin to work with this forest, so that was the initial work that they did. And we'll go and we'll look at some of, the, uh, some of the ways in which the community evolved through that phase of pioneering to become a place of, of actually networking. Because it was the networks that then created um, the community that, that is here now. So one of the things that's important in a living human system is to honor the people that have gone before you. And 
on Bowen Island, this is where we do it. We don't have a cemetery on Bowen Island, but we have this memorial garden, which is a place where people come and are invited to uh, remember those who went before. And all down the sides of this um, arbor here are the, uh, the names of um, many of our original pioneers, the people that uh, settled the island, that came here when they were young and, and made contributions, lasting contributions to uh, to the kind of places where are and we are. And if you look, some of them are veterans, so they're marked with poppies to remember the service they provided in the world uh, as members of the armed forces. So this is, uh, this is how we, this is how we uh, remember who our pioneers were. So in the original uh, pioneers creating the new system of what would later become Bowen Island, the first thing they did when they came here was to plant apple trees. And these are some of the original apple trees that were planted here on Bowen Island. So when the settlers arrived here, the first thing they did was to plant apple trees because it was the easiest way to develop the, the land that you would have preempted from the, from the government. Planting an apple tree in the ground was the, the, uh, the simplest form of development and it was the, the activity that you could do without any expectation of outcome other than that you would have apples at the end of the day. Apple trees were a good way to begin to create a new system because in order to uh, preempt land from the provincial government, you needed to improve it. And the easiest way to improve it was to stick a tree, apple tree in the ground once you cleared it. So these apple orchards um, became very easy ways in which pioneers could start a new system of creating communities and settlements on all the Gulf Islands around British Columbia. So this is really emblematic of the kind of work of pioneering. It wasn't that they did it together. These were done by um, uh, small families who were you know, ultimately working together. But the idea was that they struck out on their own. They called themselves pioneers or settlers, and they came in and they, they uh, uh, put apple trees here in, in the ground and, and began the process of creating the community that we have today. But they didn't do it with any expectation of what Bowen Island would look like today. This, for the longest time, was simply an apple orchard. Uh, it wasn't surrounded by a village, wasn't surrounded by a ferry marshalling, didn't have any of the, um, the, uh, the benefits or the big issues and problems of the 21st century island community. It was originally just an apple farm. And that's how pioneering efforts proceed. You start by doing what you can, where you are, and um, not be too committed to what the outcome is going to be like in a, in a number of years. What happens next, though, is that you end up finding others that are working together, and you begin the process of entering into conversations. And I'll show you where the, the new network of Bowen Island began. So, for a system to become one that eventually becomes powerful and influential, these pioneers need to be connected. And they end up getting connected with one another in all kinds of different ways, but they end up forming networks. And what happens in networks is that the pioneers can find one another, can share learning, can share tools and resources, and experiments have a better chance of taking hold when you start connecting people who have two parts of the same problem together. So the next phase in the development of um, systems of influence is that you find places where people can network. And this sign here for the Bowmart was uh, the oldest business on Bowen Island originally. Bowmart was a place where people would gather to discuss the current issues that were facing them, whether they were apple orchard owners or resort owners. This was a gathering space. This building in the back here um, opened in the, uh, probably in the 1950s and became a place where people would gather and talk about and organize, actually, whether it was for uh, uh, Bowen Island Improvement Association, whether it was looking for attracting more services, um, what can we do about ferry marshalling, what can we do about the problems that face a community. This was a place where people would come to connect. And cafes, of course, in small communities and large communities are still places in which networks immediately arise. But this fundamentally changes the nature of a community from just having apple farmers scattered around the island to having a place where people can gather and connect and learn from them. So this, um, this baseball diamond is perhaps uh, the best example we have just at hand of what a community of practice looks like. This wasn't built for the community of Bowen Island. This was built by the community of Bowen Island and continues to be used. This is the home of the Bowen Island Men's Fast Pitch League which is a league that's been going for many decades now um, and really represents a, um, a, tremendous, a tremendous anchor for the community spirit of the island. This diamond, the fencing, the leveling of the land, the seeding of the grass, the maintenance of everything is all undertaken by um, a volunteer labor, by all the guys that play on the, on the six teams that are in the league. It's, um, it's a really important piece of Bowen Island. In fact, when we were 
thinking about um, planning for the village and there was some thought that maybe we could move the diamond or we could do something with the diamond. There was such an uproar. This is a place of common purpose. I want to talk about a community of practice being a bunch of people who come together setting aside their own needs for a community, for a common purpose. This is what I'm talking about. It's about creating these kinds of um, these kinds of institutions, these kinds of places in a community that can then be gathering spots, that can be places in which people come together, can be places in which we actually practice as community. And communities of practice are um, critically important whether in organizations or systems or communities because they become the place in which community resilience springs from. It doesn't spring from people just meeting together in the coffee shop. It springs from places like this where people come together to work together on uh, on, a, on an object of common purpose. So one of the fundamental differences between a network and a community of practice is that people often come to a network wondering, what can I get from this? And in the community of practice, people will come to a community of practice going, what can I give to this? And that fundamental shift is what actually contributes to community resiliency and contributes to the ability for a system to transform itself into one of influence. If people are simply coming in time after time to take away from it, to be in a transactional relationship with other people, you don't get a system of influence. It doesn't last. Community of practice puts a common purpose in the center and then we organize around that and it creates the kind of stability that contributes to sustainability over time. So, um, you know, the last stage becomes uh, the system of influence. So, we began with pioneers planting apple trees, uh, people meeting in the coffee shops to, to network, people going together and creating the baseball diamond as a community of practice. This marina here, this is a private business, but it's, it's a lot of the way that people know about Bowen Island is by coming in into the marina here. This is the, uh, uh, this is one of the ways in which all of that has gone together into creating a, um, an influential system here on the island. And this is one part of the economy that we, um, we enjoy here on Bowen. This, uh, this marina definitely sprang from all of the work that had gone on before. It, it used the, the properties uh, and some of the development that came from an old resort that used to be here that uh, in the 1940s, the Union Steamship Company that faded away. The, um, the owners of the marina repurposed the name, the Union Steamship Company, and have uh, resurrected the, the idea of Bowen Island as a, as, a, as a maritime community and a place where the water plays a important role uh, in, in business and tourism and, and, and as, a, as a way of life. So this is what happens when the, the community of practice ends up becoming a system of influence. This is just the way it is. We don't think about um, this anymore. We just we kind of take the marina for granted. It wasn't always that way. But um, this is just the reality of, of, of what we have here on Bowen Island now. It's become such a part of the landscape that it's absolutely inextricably tied to who we are. If you can imagine back a hundred years, the people that were here in this bay and the First Nations people that called this bay uh, Halaklam came here to pick clams. This was a big mud flat. Um, it, they had no idea that it would one day be the home of several hundred boats and, and be one of the ways in which people from uh, our, all around the world are welcome to, are welcome to this island. So this is our this is the system of influence, this is the way it is now. So so the question is what does this have to do with the models of systems thinking and living and dying systems? Well, I think it, it has, a, has a lot to do uh, with that particular model. To, to look at the way communities and organizations actually evolve to notice that at any particular stage people are not necessarily imagining or thinking forward to what the future could be. The idea here is that living systems are complex um, and the relationship between cause and effect can't be known in advance. We can sometimes fool ourselves by looking at the effects of a situation like the story I've just told and going back and seeing, oh, if it hadn't been for these apple trees, if it hadn't been for the Beaumart, if it hadn't been for the baseball diamond, we wouldn't have what we have now here. Uh, but that doesn't mean that that retroactive coherence can give us a sense of what is coming in the future. The idea about living in complex systems is um, it's about leveraging the human capacity to be in conversation and meaning making together. So the fundamental tools um, for doing this kind of systems work are about um, good dialogue and good, good, good conversation. Several of the processes that I use for doing large scale systems uh, intervention work tools like World Cafe, open space technology, 
um, embed within them the dynamics of self-organization and the dynamics of complexity. You create a small contained complex system to make sense and uh, to generate the meaning about the larger complex system that you're in. And in this way, it helps us to um, get a strong sense about where we are and where we might go together by creating the possibility for many small experiments and many small prototypes that will help us as a community or as an organization thrive. A lot of this work has been done um, and been really captured well by Dave Snowden, um, who's, uh, whose work and whose Kniven framework I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of. And Snowden's work talks about working in the complex system space as one where in a safe to fail um, in a safe to fail prototyping situation you're creating many small prototypes that have some chance of success when they fail you learn a little bit about what they're doing if they're successful you continue to amplify them and to amp make that success grow that's how communities grow and that's how communities grow as diverse complex um, evolutionary uh, systems um, the purpose we begin thinking about the purpose of complex systems. The purpose of neighborhoods, for example, is to just create spaces in which we belong. Some of the dynamics within living systems contribute to the resiliency and stability and sustainability of those systems. If we ignore those at the, um, at the expense of uh, outcome-driven, strict cause and effect relationships, we can often be surprised by the kinds of externalities that are known as black swan events, when those self-organizing and evolutionary dynamics take over and create situations of chaos um, that we're not prepared to be in. So working with living systems gives us an idea about some of the small projects and small ways we want, might want to move forward, whether it's about looking for a return on investment or whether it's about cultivating belonging as it is here in the community, while at the same time creating the social architecture that allows us to be sustainable and resilient and able to deal with all forms of, of change, chaos, and, and surprise that come our way.